Hi, gorgeous souls, and welcome to another episode of New Age Hipster Radio. Today on the podcast, we have a very special guest. We have Rebecca Campbell. I'm so excited. I'm, I'm having such a <laughs> like a, an inner fangirl moment. I'm trying to like. <laughs> I'm trying to be cool and chill, but I'm kind of like, oh my gosh, it's exciting. Um, so for those of you who don't know Rebecca, which I think is probably nobody, but just in, just in case you don't, Rebecca Campbell is a writer, a poet, mystic, artist, ritualist, and mother. Her creations are dedicated to weaving the soul back into everyday life. A channel Rebecca has been consciously working with the rose and other plants since 2010. She is the international best-selling author of Rise, Sister, Rise, Letters to a Starseed, The Work Your Light Oracle, The Rose Oracle and Guidebook, The Starseed Oracle, and the and Light is the New Black, the book where it all started. I can't wait to talk to you about all this stuff. Welcome, Rebecca! Yay, so great to to be here and yeah, and just connect. Like you used to live in London, I used to live in London, and then now we're elsewhere. So yeah, really, yeah. really happy to chat as well. <laughs> yeah, I think we met in person once, like many, many years ago at a Hay House event, yeah, just yeah. kind of in passing. And I was like, hey, it's Rebecca. And you're like, hi. And that was like <laughs> then the, the Aussie uh, connection. <laughs> yeah. And then our whole relationship really has just been like um instagram comments and like <laughs> isn't it straight the weird yeah. world that we live in um so <laughs> would you like to start by just telling us a little bit about your origin story i love to just ask people when they come on the podcast mm. like how did you get here <laughs> in a nutshell or well, not in a nutshell whatever you want well, to you know i mean i think like when i reflect on it i i think my whole life i kind of like, I believe that I think all of us um, choose to come here to earth <laughs> at a soul level. And I do remember being quite young and like having this kind of, oh, I've come here for a reason. And and it stressed me out, to be honest, because I was like, I need to work out what it is. And I remember always having that. So I guess like there was definitely some kind of connection between um, it was always career as well for me. I, I knew that like there was like something I wanted to create or do. So I always had that. I had a very creative mum too. So she did encourage creativity, but the connection with spirituality and the soul, like I grew up Catholic, not uber Catholic, but you know, we went to church at Christmas and, and Easter. Um, I always like prayed and like, I felt a deep connection to my spirituality um, and the sacred, but I also had these like mixed feelings about it. Like, you know, it felt like, you know, I, it took a long time for me to realize that I was a mystic at heart, which is like about the direct experience with the sacred. So, you know, and I felt the sacred in nature as well, which kind of surprised me a little bit because I felt like uh, I went to a Catholic high school and it was like nature wasn't a big part of it. And so, yeah, this like on earth as it is in heaven, I always like struggled with that. And then the feminine and Mary, Magdala, you know, all of that. So it's complex. These times we live in are complex, but I was always fascinated by it, but in this push pull way. Um, and then, yeah, I, I went to university. I had a, quite a few like full on mystical experiences that that triggered big awakenings in my life, um, particularly when I was young, I had no one in my life really that I could talk to about it because it was a bit strange and weird. So it felt like I had a bit of a double life growing up, if you know what I mean. And I'd go to workshops and I'd, yeah, make these relationships with people who tended to be about triple my age or double my age and, and we'll probably triple my age at that stage, maybe four times my age. And so, yeah, I felt this kind of, again, it's this push-pull thing of like the sacred feels really normal and and like special, but ordinary as well to me. But I feel like I'm living in a world where it's it's not really revered. Um, and I could felt like I could just see it like in the waves, in the ocean, in the trees, in the flowers. Um, so I ended up going to university and doing a, um, a, a, getting a degree and, um, getting a job as a creative in advertising, um, and worked as a copywriter. So I got some really good training from a creative perspective. So, you know, I worked for 
amazing mentors who were pretty harsh, to be honest, where I'd have to like write 200 headlines for one to get through and they'd all be scrunched up. And yeah, so it was like pretty hardcore training <laughs> um, with writing and and creative ideas, um, which I now look back and I'm like, oh, that that was that's been really really helpful particularly like for creating oracles in particular and, and books of course but oracles when i create oracles it it um it feels like it, it, it i'm using the channel which i'd always had but also i i also worked as an art director i'd worked with designers i'd worked with all different types of creatives and so yeah creating oracles to me is like that training ground I had of like come up with all these ideas and I would always channel them in nature. I'd do it before work and then I'd go and sit in my cubicle and just pretend to work. But really I'd done my work on my own. I could never come up with ideas with other people around. It had to be like me kind of like communing. So yeah. And then, yeah, it was your classic Saturn returns, like edging towards that in my late twenties. And I, I just realized that this, career, this life that I'd consciously built and I had consciously built it was just not aligned to who I was anymore. And, you know, that's not to say it's all wasted and it was all wrong because I, I got a lot from it and, you know, met amazing people along the way, but it was just, I just couldn't do it anymore. And so it was that sinking feeling of like, oh my God, am I really going to throw all this away? And of course it's not throwing it away, but and then I reflected and I'm like, what am I passionate about? And, and what am I trained in? And I realized I was like, just, sorry. I was just as um, qualified in the mystical arts as I was in communication and creativity. And so, I, oh, I could bring these two together. Like, I love creating. That was the thing that kept me in, in that job. But uh, I just, I'm, all of my spare time, I'm spending like, connecting with all things mystical um and I have been studying this in quite a structured way since I was like 14 um and so yeah it it, it you know reached that moment and I, I I'm sure you've had it as well where you're like oh, okay I'm gonna do this and it took you know it's it's it, one big leap looks like um it's one big leap but it never is it's like thousands and thousands and thousands of baby steps so yeah that's essentially the origin story, I guess, <laughs> or a version of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so many, so many things I want to ask you. Um, but I'm curious to know, like, how did you then go from there, from that point of like, this just doesn't light me up to use one of your phrases anymore. How did you then kind of go from that job into, okay, now you're a best-selling author. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because I, I went through, like, I think a lot of us do. I'm like, what the heck am I going to call myself? Like, what is it that I'm doing? And, you know, you're trying to figure it out as you're trying to do it. The main thing that I did was I didn't, I wasn't in a rush. And I just, I, I remember hearing someone say something like, you know, if you do one thing every day um, within five years, you'll be there. And, you know, and then you read other books like, you know, Stephen Pressfield, I read a lot of his work and other people's where it's, it is like about like the discipline for the artist essentially. Um, and, and I think yeah, I know that, that every creative needs a deadline as well. Otherwise, you know, we'll be still writing the same book because it's never, I would be writing my first book if I didn't have a deadline. Cause you're like, let me add this. Let me add this. Let me add this. Um, and so, yeah, I committed to Showing up to my daily practice every day it sounds simple, but it was like completely transformative at the same time at that. I don't do that now because I've got kids and it's not possible, but um, I do show up to a daily practice, but it's not the same time and it's not first thing in the morning. Um, but then I was single. I did not have kids. And so I was like, okay, uh, my soul path, my soul calling is my priority. It's the most important thing for me. Like I've got this window of time and I, and it felt like that. It felt like grab it now, which was not to say it couldn't happen later because it could, but I just, I could feel this call towards me or um, me towards it. And so I ended up showing up to my daily practice and, and then I journal straight after that. And it was just like a 10 minute meditation. And then I journal. And then after journaling, I'd write um, one baby step I was going to take that day. 
So it might be call this person or work out what a plugin is <laughs> <laughs> or buy a URL or do one post on Instagram. Um, like it was baby steps and that definitely caused the biggest shift. And some days I'd do 100 things, but it I had to do one thing every day. Um, and at the time I was working as a creative director in advertising and um, to be honest, like I, I worked really hard, like um, it's a tough industry and I really, really wanted to create my business. So, you know, I couldn't work as much as I did now then. Um, I definitely, yeah, I, I, I sacrificed a lot. Um, but, you know, I was also living on the other side of the world from family. So I didn't have as many responsibilities. Um, and, you know, I'd work on a Saturday, for example, um, I just wouldn't go out partying or anything like it was my number one. Um, and so it was like probably about a year or two of, of that, um, uh, because I, I did need to work. And so I, and then I went from five days a week down to three days a week. Um, and so those other two days were solely focused, um, on, on my work. And then I'd also work the Saturday, um, and then I started, I'd been trained in a few different modalities. And I think the biggest leap was like <gasps> doing sessions. I got to do sessions. And I, so I was doing that when I was working full time, I kind of was like, okay, I've got time for three sessions a week, for example. Um, and yeah, it, it actually was helpful, I think, because it was like, I'm I'm not into scarcity, but it was actually forced scarcity because I only had three spots a week. Um, and so that actually, I'm really glad that I didn't like quit my job and then feel like I had to like make it work. Um, I knew I was, so I put it off so much like doing this work cause I was afraid. Um, and you know, just like putting myself out there in that way that was different to my reputation that I had, you know, it was big. And so I just, I did it very incrementally, but very consistently. Um, and I think that was, that was really, really great. And then, um, I, it was, I think my last day of work was around o October of, um, what year was that? 20, 2013 was my last time, like day of my uh, going part-time. And, um, yeah, I had, I, I went to uh, the month or a couple months before I went to, um, the owner of the company and I said, Hey, look, I've always had this dream to write a book. I intentionally didn't say I'm leaving to start a spiritual business or anything because <laughs> that was just too, that was too much for me. It just it was too much. And yeah, like I, I needed to be, I think this is the thing, like you don't have to like go and tell everyone the way it is. Like just tell them the version of it that they'll be able to receive it because I was also very tender. Like if people had a laughed at me, I, I, you know, it, it would have knocked me about way more than it does now. And so I, I was like, okay, cool. How could he hear me here? And also I was like, if it doesn't work, I need to like, make sure I'm not like, you know, forgetting like, you know, just burning bridges or whatever. So I said, I've always, I, I'm a writer, right? He knows me as a, as a creative director who spent, who, who trained copywriter art director. So I said, I've always wanted to write a book. It's my dream. I've got this amazing window of time right now where, you know, my life's really changed and, and I don't have many responsibilities. And so I need to take it now. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give myself six months to write a book. So that's what I said, rather than I'm leaving this industry and I'm, it, which was true. Um, but yeah. And so it was like my elevator pitch for that career and the industry, which was so amazing. And it was brilliant because Anytime I said it, like even to clients, cause you know, we had to like tell everyone and all of this and they were like, oh my gosh, I've got a dream to fill in the blank. And so it, it actually turned into them saying what they really wanted with their life and nothing to do with me, like writing a spiritual book. <laughs> and I would tell them when they'd say, what it's, a, what is it about? I, I would tell them, but yeah, so that, that was like really, really important. Um, and I think for me as well, I knew that I really wanted to write. I'd prayed a lot on like, you know, that thing of what do we, what do I call myself? And what do I, like, 
what is it that I'm doing exactly? Because you're figuring it out as well as you go. And and my process personally is to kind of like write to myself and then I figure out what I'm writing. <laughs> and, you know, I think a lot of writers do do this where it's like, what do I need to hear today? And sometimes I'll do it to like a younger self, for example. But yeah, so I, I gave myself those six months and and I also, then I moved into a, a I was in a, a one bedroom or studio in Notting Hill and I moved into a share house where I ran, I would ride in my bedroom and I'd walk up to Re- Regent's Park, Rose Garden there. But, you know, I, I really condensed down um, to give myself the, the best opportunity and to also take the pressure off having to pay the bills like in a in a grabby way like as in like I need all these clients you know and so I, I did I limited my client work again um, because I knew that writing was like what I was really being called to do um, even more so than that um, and I wrote every day And it was actually amazing. And I'd be sharing it every day. Again, it was the daily discipline, not the all in thing. So I'd go, I'd walk in nature each morning um, up until probably about um, 12, one o'clock every day. And that's when I'd do my writing. And then I'd come back and I'd work on the business um, and I'd like do client sessions in the afternoon. Um, And that's, that's always worked for me. I mean, now I'm writing my fourth book, I've got two kids and it's so much harder because I personally, not everyone's like this, but my process is very feminine and it's very channeled and I need quiet. I need no distractions. And yeah, it's, it's much harder now than it was then. But yeah, when I have written books in the past, like I, um, like my business has grown a bit now. I have people who work with me and and in the company. And so I've always had a complex relationship with that because I'm like, ultimately I just want to be in a room on my own and and write (laughs) um but yeah so it's like finding that balance you know (laughs) yeah I'm so I'm so so glad that you shared all of that because I think sometimes when we're looking at people online or we're looking at their book sales and all of this stuff it can kind of look like oh this person has just kind of they've got all the luck or they've you know had like this big break or whatever but actually you know, in hearing how it was from you, for you, like that whole, whole process was like, mm. actually there was a lot, go- <laughs> there was a lot going on. A lot. Quite a, there, quite always a long time. Is. there always is. Yeah. I think, yeah. and, and particularly when it's a call that comes from within, like, you know, I don't know anyone who's just answered it the moment it comes, you know? Mm. Mm. And I yeah, think, definitely. Yeah. I think, it, and it does require discipline. It doesn't mean that you have to hustle, hustle, hustle. But like, when I look back, like, I'm like, it really affected my health, um, trying to work two jobs. Um, but had I not done that, I don't think I would have been able to be in a fi- financial position to have my rent paid for six months in order to do what I needed to write that book. So Oh, it's so it's so complex isn't it um and I think when I look back as well like in the different phases of life like when you're in your early 20s um maybe that is the time to hustle it's definitely not now for me like everything mm-hmm. I'm being called to do is slow down and rest and rejuvenate and you know all of that and find a balance and we need to look at the cycles of nature but maybe there's different seasons in our life where it is it is it, it's time to go, but you got to rest after each project. And I think this is the a huge challenge for um, uh, those of us who are online and entrepreneurial, because there's always another idea. There's always a new creative project and, but we'll just burn out. And so, yeah, that's the, that's, that's a big challenge, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, re- I resonate with that. <laughs> I resonate with that quite a lot. Yeah. Um, I would love to ask you, one thing that I think is so beautiful and um, really inspiring about you and your journey and just the way that you talk about things is this way that you just kind of seem to follow, um, you follow the thing, you call it, follow, I like to call them like the cosmic breadcrumbs and you just kind of mm-hmm. pick them up and you go and you, um, you know, you, you've, you've got to where you are by just following the nudges. 
And I'd love for you to share with us, especially for those for those people who are listening, who are kind of in that place right now of like, I have no idea what my purpose is or what I'm supposed to be doing. Or for those of us who feel like we've kind of got it, <laughs> like mm. we kind of know what we're doing, but there's still, you know, I think for so many yeah. of us, there's still that doubt, like, is this the right way? Is this what we're supposed to be doing? Oh, I think what's helped me is to realize that there are so many different expressions of our purpose. <clears throat> and so like I used to see purpose as, cause that, that's kind of what I'm getting. Like it, the purpose is like, it's like, but it's, what do you do every day to get to the purpose and all that. Mm -hmm. But I think I used to see purpose as like this more like a destination or a identity or a, like an answer versus a, a day-to-day dance with life essentially um and because I was waiting for like the certainty like you know I I remember writing this thing of like I just want God to tell me what it is and basically I wanted like a clear sign or letter like this is your purpose um and I was waiting for it literally and looking back I'm like I kind of knew but I wasn't certain and I don't think we're ever certain when we're called, particularly when we're called to change and grow and we're ever changing beings in an ever changing world, we're going to be constantly called to change and grow. And so I think that we need to find a way to enter into that dance with life, cosmos, God, soul, whatever. So we're responding. So we're like receiving, responding, receiving, responding, receiving, responding, and then at the same time, recognizing we live in a cyclic world and the seasons show us that. So we're not meant to be in spring and summer constantly. So what you were doing in spring and summer, and that might be like inner rather than outer. So that could be four years ago, will be completely different or slightly different to what it is now. And if we try and cling to what we think it is and continue on at that speed or at that, like doing that same thing. And we haven't changed and grown. It's going to feel stagnant and forced and like, we're going to feel stuck um, because we're not being like, um, I struggle not to use nature analogies all the time. So stop me if it gets too much, but um, <laughs> like it. the flower, the rose, for example, I've got, I often have like these rose petals here. I don't know if, lots of people are listening, but, um, rather than seeing us, but they're basically dried petals that have fallen off a flower in front of me. So it's kind of like the rose that we don't think is the rose. We see the rose as the bloom, right? Um, the bud and then the bloom, but actually if that rose didn't release its petals to the wind, offer it to nourish the soil. And if it didn't like trust itself, in winter when it seems so barren and like nothing's happening. If we didn't trust that actually beneath the surface, so much is actually happening, then we wouldn't come around to the next spring and the next summer. And so I think that um, that's been like a never ending lesson for me um, because I think change is hard, um, especially when like, I think it's especially complex when you look at business as well, because there's like, I, I've, I've been talking a little bit lately about like the mystic versus the machine or creating versus producing. And it's so easy to create it first, but then it turns into producing mm. because you know what works or you, this is what everyone says you need to do. But then you lose the spark because in the spirit, because it's like, we're not meant to just produce and be a machine. We're here to create and give birth to life. Um, so yeah, it's complex, but I, I, but I remember, um, particularly like in, in that period when, um, around 2010 to 2012, 13, um, the biggest, the, the thing that really changed it all was because I'd had visions since, since I was honestly like a teenager 
in this spiritual bookstore in Australia in Manly. It's not there anymore. It was called Living Harmony. I'd go there all school holidays and just like be fascinated. I'm drawn to it. You know, I look back and I'm like, oh my God, like, why didn't someone tell me like, this is your path? It was like pretty freaking obvious yeah. <laughs> when I look back. Um, but yeah, and, and I think that's the thing because often the things that are not normal are the indicators, the things that are not normal about us, but then we want to be, we want to fit in. Whereas actually, if we see the things that are not normal, that we're fascinated by, oh, it's so obvious. And it's always obvious looking back. But anyway, so I had this vision of um, me having books and 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 um, other things in the world and and doing workshops and all that. Like I had that vision so early on, but it took like, two decades for me to finally be like, oh, no, I'm going to do this now. Mm -hmm. Well, not quite two decades. I think it was like 18 years. Um, and then the, the bit that made it possible to do was I remember like praying and praying and praying. And then what I got, and I do this on a Sunday night, you know, like when you're ready to go back to work and I'd like <laughs> have like these soulful Sundays just to kind of like regulate myself in order to be able to go back to work. <laughs> um, and I remember, yeah, being in my flat in Highbury and being, hearing like follow what lights you up. And I was really pissed off because that just seemed really lame. Like, oh, like, you know, but then I realized that's when I discovered that nature and flowers and beauty lit me up, um, which is like such a core thing to me now, of course. But at the time it felt really like, flimsical and just like small and how could that possibly but then of course like I was saying before so I started buying myself a bunch of flowers a week and then I started planting flowers on my little um on my windowsill and then I started discovering the the parks of London which I know you'll resonate in like I didn't really grow up going to beautiful parks. It's a different thing in England. Like we'd go to the beach or whatever. But I I discovered these parks and the writing came. So it was following what lit me up. Mm. Um, and so if you follow what lights you up and then when you're in that communing space, receive guidance and then act on that guidance, then we're like following this golden thread, but you can't know every step along the way. And that's why it's, it takes courage to live an intuitive life, to, to live a guided life. It, it's not easy I mean, it sounds easy, but actually doing it, actually trusting it, it takes like discipline of showing up as well as deep faith. How have you found that? Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> yeah, like really similar. It's um, so interesting, like hearing you. Show. I mean, I know, I, I know your story parts of your story because I've heard, yeah. heard it many times. Um, I remember when you first brought out your first book and I was listening to all your podcasts and like, oh, Rebecca's on a podcast. I'm going to listen to her <laughs> story. So I've kind of heard that story, but you know, like um, sitting in the witchy shop, reading the new age mm -hmm. books and the witchy books, like that was always like my, um, yeah, my happy place. So yeah, it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like with my with my journey, I just kind of fell into it more than that <laughs> more than that I was really? like, oh, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. Mm. Um, yeah, I was kind of like pursuing a different dream, and then it kind of just I was like, oh, maybe I do some tarot readings just for a bit of extra money, uh -huh. <laughs> and then it kind of was like, oh, okay, and this now is what I, I do. Know. Yeah, <laughs> and I, like I I never it's like you know you you spoke about having this vision of like oh I'm gonna do do books and and all this stuff. And like I never, I never had, <laughs> I never had a vision. It was like a complete surprise that I've written spiritual books and done decks and stuff because that was just that's not, amazing. Yeah, it was <laughs> never ever something that I ever thought that I would do, be wow. able to do, or want to do. But here we are. <laughs> wow. So, I don't know. Wow. I was yeah, like blindly, like blindly following the. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I'm going. I don't think you have to have like this like big vision, you know. I think I think the reason I mentioned that vision is that like you could say that I was super clear on it. Mm -hmm. And even still it was hard to trust it, you know? And so yeah. I think like, yeah, and so it is simple, but it's 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 not as well, you know? And because I think it does stop a lot of us like 
when it seems like, uh, like it just happens, you know? And I think sometimes like, you know, just like in relationships and, and all parts of life, like it does require courage every now and then. Like, I'm sure there's parts of what you've done all along the way that like has been really challenging. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to yeah. this work. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, yeah. Think, and like, then the courage yeah. that's required to, to, to trust it. Mm, yeah. Every, like everyone that I know who's kind of stepped into doing spiritual work at any point has mm. like, you know, you can, you can't even list the amount of times that you've thought about giving up. Because it's just totally. like, oh, every couple of days it's like, oh, should I just, yeah, but we keep going. It's so true. <laughs> it's so true. And I think the, the thing with like these times we're living in as well, you know, like everything's crumbling, like not just in the spiritual world, like everything is crumbling and we're re-looking and, and unlearning and learning and re-choosing and all of that. And, you know, I think that, um, I think it's why, like, I resonate most with the path of the mystic. Like I've, I've got such deep, um, respect for anyone who chooses whatever path, like, you know, and multiple or one or whatever and religions and all of that. Um, but it just seems like everything's crumbling around us, you know? And, and I think the thing that I've grappled with the most is that like, there's, it feels like there's never been like a one path that feels like 100% true. Do you know what I mean? And then, but I'm like, I don't think I know the answer, but I, I, I can, I can feel the sacred pulse of life and I want to have direct experience with it. Like I, I want to pray. I want to meditate. I want to, um, you know, have these moments of being in awe of life, um, and trust life. I really do want to. Um, and yeah. And I think this is like completely normal that, that well, particularly for a mystic is like the deeper you get on the journey, the more you realize, like, it's all a great mystery. You know, we can try and put words around it. We can try and be like, oh, listen to this, don't listen to this or whatever. But it's like, ultimately, it's it's like what what is harmonious to your heart that is each of our paths. And, and yeah, and those big questions, like what happens when we die? What is the soul? Like, what is the purpose of life? Like, we can't possibly know the certain answers, but we can check in with how it feels, you know? Mm. yeah oh my gosh I'm just there's yeah I, I feel like this conversation is really activating because I feel like I'm getting all these like mm. all these little little downloads and little like oh ping 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 um, <laughs> which is of course like why everyone loves you so much and loves your work because I feel like your work is so activating like when your when your first book came out light is the new black people went absolutely crazy for that because everybody felt like it was written for them <laughs> Everyone was mm. like, this is, this is written for me. I bawled my eyes out. I remember when I read that, I bawled wow. my eyes out. <laughs> oh, that's really moving. Well, you know, yeah, that, that feels really moving. Cause like, I remember it, like journaling every day about like that I needed to write a book. And obviously I was a creative. I knew how to come up with ideas. I could have written a book that was much easier, like on how to meditate or mm -hmm. not that there's anything wrong with that, but like, that's not my path, <laughs> you know, like I could have yeah. written something that was straightforward for me, but what I kept on getting. And I remember being so pissed off with God, like crying about it literally. And it was like, you need like, you're a light worker, which is like a term that really was very activating for me. I, I don't use it so much now. I use, more use the term mystic, but and I think these words help us mm -hmm. claim who we are and, you know, just like words, just like all different parts of our path. It's like there's chapters and then you kind of move and, and sometimes you stay there and sometimes you're not. But for me, that term light worker was like, oh, that's how I've always felt like that's, it was so true. And then I received, and you need to write a book to encourage light workers to gather the courage to step onto their path, into their path, to trust their path mm -hmm. and, our, and share their voice. And I was like, oh, how can I do that when I don't have the courage to do it myself? And then 
God or goddess or whatever answered, that's exactly why you need to do it. And you need to write it to yourself. And so I was like properly writing it to myself at 14, at 24, at 28, at whatever age, um, as well as to us all. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, we're so connected. We're all so connected. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, I think this is, you know, I'm sure you've got um, lots of healers and light workers and people who are doing this work in the world. And I think that like, I remember the, one of the biggest challenges um, for me, and I remember saying to one of my teachers, like she would just, you know, do, do a workshop and know what to say and um, wrote all these books and all of this. And I was just like, but how, you know, I'd be writing down word for word what I was going to say in my workshops and, oh, was just a really it really like scared me doing that and I didn't feel ready and she was like you'll get there like it's just you're creative like you know it, it'll be easy like it's just easy and I, I just I couldn't fathom how that would be the case and yet now I mean I'm constantly being stretched and stuff but now I'm like I used to be so stressed before I would teach a workshop and then I'd let spirit come in and it would always work but but the, when I didn't have the experience of, you know, they say that the, what is it, 10,000 hours or whatever, oh, it's so challenging, you know, and we can feel like the, the big shift in me happened when I realized we're just here to share our truth and what is true for us. And you need, we need to be like not attached to the outcome of whether people are going to receive it or agree with it or whatever. And to, to realize that like, we're all, you know, like that beautiful Ram Dass quote of like, we're all walking each other home, ourselves included. Mm. And yeah, to be like the expert, which I think we feel like we need to be when we're starting anything new, like, oh, I need to appear like I'm the expert because we feel like we're faking it because we're beginners. We're just stepping into it. But particularly from the spiritual perspective, like we can't possibly know the answers. And so let's just share what feels true and let's share our stories because that's how we connect. That's how we learn and grow. Um, and let's sh share what fascinates us as well. Like we don't have to be like, this is the answer. And I think that's been like in part, like why so much agony has been caused with religion as well, which again, I love devotional paths, but the answer is there really like one answer mm. and we're trying to work out an answer from ancient mystical texts essentially like and i don't know if they were written that way because it's talking about something which is ineffable or because it needed to be coded or whatever but like we can't possibly know <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and speaking speaking of mysteries i would love to talk a little bit about star seeds uh-huh and about oh. galactic origins because i like <laughs> i love love loved your star scene book your star scene deck i was like all over that so i would love to um to just kind of talk about that for a little bit like what's your how'd you get how did you get into this whole star seed thing i also want to know like where you're from where you're from like what planet are you from um what planet do you think i'm from <laughs> <laughs> well here's the thing again that word star seed was another activating one for me um and this concept of like our souls having experienced elsewhere um for me it actually made logical sense because I'm like, if you look at the cosmos, knowable, like there's got to be life elsewhere that we just can't see. Like it just makes sense to me, you know? So from a logical perspective, because it does sound out there, but logically that made sense to me. Then I discovered, um, particularly when I was, I was um, working on the Oracle and, 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 and Letters to a Star Seed, I started discovering, um, you know, there's all those like meme quotes about this, but like it's actual science where we have stone, ancient exploded stars in our cells, in our bones. Like what? Um, even like the water that is here on earth and, and life on earth can't exist without water is thought to have come from elsewhere. So 
there's the physical part of it as well as the 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 mystical part of it um and yeah i had been studying um mystic arts especially um at this point when i came across the word um uh the akashic records um and um training to do like soul readings in in this really structured way and part of that training was um the soul's history so so biography of the soul um where the soul has experienced elsewhere then and when i first came across that like i just wept because i ha had always had this like longing for home without quite being able to name what it was this search and and i do think that that is double-edged in the sense of like I do think that for me anyway is from a soul perspective but I think that there is like a human part of that as well where it's like a match for the longing <laughs> do you know what I mean like mm -hmm. um whether it's an ancestral thing like you know I'm a white European descent woman um I grew up in Australia and like you I, I came over here to Europe and I think there there is a bit of that in there as well of like being on land different to ancestry etc um but anyway, when I started exploring starseeds, I had I had this notion of, oh, we're from one place. Like I'm from, I felt very connected to a particular um, starseeds and called like um, Mintaka, which is Orion's belt. Um, and I had, had all these visions of places elsewhere, which is literally why I wanted to create oracle decks because I'd had these visions since I was young and I wanted to like get them onto into the physical you know um and yeah and that was really the um uh from the cosmic sense um although now I see cosmic as earth as well <laughs> um everything is the cosmos ordered universe but from the from the galactic sense right the stars sense that was the work light oracle and the star seed oracle um, and, but then as I started really working on the Starseed Oracle, I was like, hang on, it doesn't feel right to just like focus it, even though we're visualizing that I really wanted the messages to invite Starseeds to be here, not mm -hmm. to kind of long to be someplace else, which is true. And I resonated with that, but I'm like, that's not helpful. Like mm -hmm. that stops us from being here. It make, doesn't make us happier. That's for sure. Um, acknowledging the feeling is important if it's there, because that's truth. If, if that is true for someone, but spending all our times dreaming of being someplace else is, is, is detrimental really. So yeah, that was really important to me. Um, in when I, when I, um, I had pitched the deck and I'd actually pitched, pitched the deck years before straight after light is a new black and they were like star seed that's a bit <laughs> out there and then i don't know it got popular on tiktok or something and then yeah. all of a sudden it's like oh it. becca there's this new trend i'm like oh come on <laughs> we laugh about that now um but anyway um yeah so but i'm really glad that it didn't happen that deck didn't happen then because if it had happened then i would have it would have been about looking towards the stars rather than looking towards here so it, like i feel so protected in that way because yeah that was th th the way i did it was how i was meant to do it um so yeah it always i think when those doors are, are shut it's always for a reason i'm very grateful for that um but yeah so then um the deck was all about like how can we um, bring our soul and our star seed nature so basically for me that is like our our each soul is a star seed particularly um and i'm not convinced on whether it's just a special few or every soul um i'm not clear on that i used to be clear on that i'm not clear on that now um but what i do know is that i've done soul readings for for many people who have these memories of elsewhere or this longing for elsewhere um and i see a, a star seed as a soul who has woken up and is like, I'm here for a reason. That to me is a star seed. They've yeah. consciously chosen to come in for some reason. The star seeds that I've read for, um, every one of them had some, um, some urge 
to be part of some collective change. So I call that double mission. So, cause I think every, every soul, every person is here to grow and learn. I do believe that. Um, and an experience being in the physical, right. But every star seed, I, or everyone who resonated with the term also resonated with, um, this is a time of change and healing. And I know there's something I'm meant to do, which is not just like for me to be happy. It's like, I want to contribute. And yeah, I'm not certain of how, what percentage that is, or if it's everyone once we wake up and that is just part of being activated and awoken. But anyway, so yeah, I did used to see it as like ha a being from a particular place, but then the shift came um, while I was working on that deck. And I'd been, I'd been curious about this for a little while, while I did the readings and, and while I explored my own, um, if you call it soul ancestry or biography. Um, <clears throat> and while there was a particular place that I felt like, felt like home, like I felt like so calm and just like, yes, when I connected to it, there were many other places that I felt connected to. And so I inquired a lot about that and I was like, oh my gosh, it's just like our life, this life, like with you, Vix, like you, w where in Australia did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Canberra. In Canberra. Yeah. Okay, cool. So not, not that far yeah. from you. Not, yeah, yeah. So you grew up in Canberra, you went to London, I'm sure there was other places along the way, and then you went back to Australia, but to a different place, right? Mm -hmm. And each of those places, has that like changed you and imprinted you and, and like developed who you are as a person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And so I think it's the same from a soul perspective. Mm -hmm. So each place that our soul experiences, it changes us. Like even for me having, um, I grew up on the Northern beaches in Sydney. Um, I, each time I've traveled, it's changed me, but living in London, oh my God, that changes you, doesn't it? Like in good <laughs> oh, yeah. and bad way. <laughs> <laughs> and then a bit being in England, like in the UK and Europe, that changes you. And then I, I currently live in Glastonbury. Oh my God, that mm, has wow, changed me. Yeah. That's so different from, from London. Um, and who, who knows where else I will be led next, or maybe I'll be here forever or back in Australia or whatever, but each of those places is, has, has influenced who I am. And, you know, at the moment I'm, I'm, I've, I lived in Australia a bit longer than here, but those years are clocking up. <laughs> and so then it's like, where is home? Mm -hmm. Do you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I do think that. And so I'd say that I, I think that your soul has experienced multiple places. And mm -hmm. I think that you've gone to multiple places to learn and grow as well. Like I, I believe that, that um, yeah, I feel like with, with you in particular, like you've been to different places studying in like, um, uh, you know, different like mystery schools in, in different places as well to, to work on different things and to, yeah, like, yeah. So I don't think it is just one place. Mm. I'm so glad you said that. Cause I feel like there's so much like BS <laughs> around the whole yeah, like, cause it's like, thing. But it's, it's the, it's the disassociation yeah. of the longing for elsewhere, yeah. Yeah. which, yeah. which it's not just disassociation though, because I do believe there's truth, but mm. then we can kind of like use it as a way to, like get like jump out rather than jump in particularly now because <clears throat> there is just so much mass healing happening on the planet and healing is excruciating healing is not pretty the awakening process is not easy even if it's like a spontaneous awakening and i've had a couple of them they required just as much integration if not more than the others because every <clears throat> part of you needs to come online and anchor it and embody it and integrate it. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not just all yeah. like pretty like galactic pictures, yeah, yeah, yeah. even though it'd be great if it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember I had this, I had this reading done like years ago and this woman, um, I always felt like I was Palladian. I was really like yeah. tapped into that 
frequency and I was like oh yeah this totally resonates and she did this Akashic Records reading for me and she said oh no you're definitely Syrian and I was well, so, it's so interesting because I was they were the two that I was going to say and I'm like I, really- I just don't want to say them because it's like like we should answer ourselves yeah. where we're from yeah. you know like yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I remember being like so angry at her. I was like, oh, how dare you? Like, I thought I was this, not this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then I kind of actually found that I, um, once I kind of got used to the idea, I started connecting in with the Syrian energy and I was like, oh, actually, I kind of like this better. (laughs) Like, this actually feels like more. Well, I know, like, like, because Christ has been part of your path and I've, I've read a lot of stuff about that you know, and again, who, who freaking knows, but there being a, a, lots of people have channeled that. So that makes sense to be like, yeah. And here's the other thing, like, you know, all we have on all of this is channel material. So that just means what, what one person, two people, whoever says, right. And like, I, I love that. Like, I love that we have that and it's important, but like, you look up at the sky, there's a lot more out there yeah, yeah. than what is channeled. Yeah. And so, and so also like, and, and I know this and it, and it's kind of why I don't really do structured readings anymore because like, even if you are the clearest channel, our, um, our personal capacity influences that. Mm. So like, Maybe your you your soul's experience places that I don't even have comprehension of, you know. Yeah. So, but it doesn't. To say, I'm not saying that it's bad. Like it's it's amazing, and it's been such an important part of my path to go and receive that information for confirmation or to open doors for me. But then ultimately, the deeper I get, the more I'm like, no, it's like if we if we're attached to this like answer as the answer then it's actually detrimental ultimately because it stops us from actually communing directly Mm. and then words are important as we've been saying like like oco mystic star say blah 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 they're important serious blade is whatever yeah (laughs) but they're also limiting so Mm. they're important to be able to reach for something in order to anchor it and embody it but they're also restrictive because what we're trying to express is ineffable like there are no words that you can wrap around it and it is a mystery (laughs) so you know you've got yeah, yeah, so that's the that's the podcast episode today. Everything's a mystery. <laughs> um, Everything is a mystery. <laughs> we're already getting close to time, and we haven't even spoken about your new deck. I'd love if if you could just share a little bit about that um, before we finish. I have it. I actually have it here somewhere to show people. It was it was here anyway. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Um, I'd love to know just a little bit about like how it came to be. Like how did you kind of start to connect in with the energy of the water, and how did that yeah. start kind of speaking to you? Yeah. So the Healing Waters Oracle. Um, well, interestingly, because the 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 place that I was talking about before, my vision of that is water, <laughs> like crystal, crystal clear water. And so even like the co- cover of the deck is like connected to that. <laughs> mm. um, but anyway, um, so I think for me, um, where it really began was I, I'd created my mystery school, the Inner Temple Mystery School training. Um, And we work on six different mysteries in nature. So it's about attuning to the wisdom of nature and life in the cosmos, right? And so having a direct experience with the sacred. And if you look at all spiritual traditions, water is used in so many ceremonies, rituals. It's it's for purifying, cleansing, healing. We all know that. Um, And I, I then I moved to Glastonbury and started developing for the first time in my life a very conscious relationship with water um as you may or may not know there are two sacred wells here um that that call pilgrims to them from all over the world um of all different paths um and 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 a lot of people here as well will like walk to the wells every day and fill up their water bottles and start 
really working consciously with water. And I'm not just talking spiritually, although it is spiritual, literally fetching your water. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it really opened my mind of like this conscious relationship that we have with water. Of course, I'd read Emoto's work and and I'd, I'd, I'd learned a little bit about um, water and consciousness, but it wasn't until I moved here that I was, I had the direct experience of it. And I'd go and sit at the water um, every day. Um, and th- that was my new place of creating um, at that point. Anyway, then when I started um, in the mystery school, we have um, two sections for each mystery, what's known and what's unknown. So what's known is like ancient folklore and like, history basically of this mystery and then what's unknown is you doing practices to have the direct experience to receive wisdom and and invite that um mystery that part of nature in this case water to be your guide and as i was re- researching the what's known i just was blown away by the fact that that where there is water there is life where there is life there is water on this planet life can't exist without water. And so I was like, whoa, like what is water? Like if life, (laughs) like our soul can't be here without water. Whoa. Like it just blew my mind. And I started researching and, and, and yeah, discovering so much about what so many mystics and theologians and scientists have said about this, this incredible thing that is essential to life here on earth um and yeah that's basically where where it came from um and yeah and so yeah i um one of the mysteries in the mystery school is the rose um and i had created the oracle with the rose which is rose had been such a big part of my path um and then once that had been complete it was it it was a little while and i was back in australia and i was walking to the water um at long reef where i grew up in my in my childhood and working on that module in the mystery school and i was just i was like oh my gosh this this is an oracle oh my gosh how amazing like i had i had um i'd actually been contracted to do an oracle on lemuria um and I kind of think this is that deck. <laughs> it's just called something different, you know, because there's that water connection. And so, yeah, I um, I spoke to my publisher, and she was like, "Oh, yes, it's it, this is definitely the next one." So, yeah, it was very, very amazing. Yeah, mm. and it was just such a beautiful. But it was it, it wasn't an easy deck to create. Um, I worked on it with Katie Louise, who um is the artist of the Rose Oracle as well we work so well together. Um, but she, she started struggling with it as well. And like, I was trying to do, I do altar work a lot. And I was, I called her up. I'm like, I'm I'm trying to work on this module for the mystery school, but I'm also trying to do it for us, for our, um, Oracle. Cause I often do altar work while I'm working on a project and I'm really struggling to do a, a water altar like, why is that? She's like, oh my gosh, me too. And we realized it's because water is in every living thing and it like, it it wants to flow. And so, yeah. And the creative process of creating that Oracle was the same. It was like, oh my God, like, you know, the water, it was stagnant. Then it was like flowing and wishy-washy and yeah. And we went through all of these stages and then it was frozen. Yeah. So yeah, it was, um, it was, it was harder, but I, I, than the rose and other decks, but it was, it was a beautiful process that yeah we both went through. Yeah. That's so interesting. And it's such a beautiful deck. So I'm glad you persisted. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what do you have coming next? Can you tell us anything about what you're doing now, what you're working on? Yeah, sure. So, um, the two main things I'm doing is um, I've got my inner temple mystery school training. So it's a nine month journey. Um, and so, yeah, I've got students going through that and then we'll be opening um, for the third class that we've done in um, it's October. And then I'm, I'm writing my fourth book as well. I've been writing it for quite a while, to be honest. Like I started writing before I had um, my first child who's almost four (laughs) and then it's just yeah I haven't quite been this process on that book is um it's a lot um 
wilder than other things I've created. So other things have kind of come in, in the way, but yeah, it's, um, it's coming together now. So that's what I'm working on. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I can't, I can't wait, whatever it is. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm here for it. I have like all your, all your books, all your decks, like on my bookshelf. Um, this has been amazing. I just, I feel so grateful that you gave us your time today. It's been amazing to chat with you and to listen to all of your wisdom. I feel like a little bit of like a baby witch in your presence. Like you're so, you're so, <laughs> like you're so wise. It just feels like, oh, you know, like you've, this is not your first, this is not your first time here doing this work, right? Yeah. Um, yeah it just kind of like, oh, I just, I just feel it. I just feel it in my, oh. feel it in my waters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As we, as we say in Australia. Uh, exactly. So good. So good. <laughs> Um, Who knew Kath and Kim were mystics? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, oh definitely, definitely. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you, everyone, for listening, for tuning in. If you would like to connect with Rebecca, you want to find out more about her, I will put all of her links in the show notes so that you can go straight there. And, um, yeah, hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. Thanks, gorgeous souls. We'll see you next time.